infrastructure for usable machine learning. He is an ACM Flow and IEEE Fellow uh, for contributions to multi-core processors, and he is the recipient of 2018 IEEE Computer Society Harry H. Good Memorial Award. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Olukutan. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is a mic on. I typically don't need a mic. I've got a loud voice. Uh, so uh, it's great to be here. I've uh, been an IEEE Computer Society uh, member for since I've been in grad schools, which is you know, over 30 years ago. So, uh, so it's so good to... your mic is not on. Turn on your mic. Uh, uh, great. Okay, now it's on. Okay. So, so now I'm going to have to reduce my volume. Uh, so as I said, I've, I've been an IEEE member for, for many years, and so it's uh, fun to, to be here to, to uh, talk to you about uh, some of the work we've been doing at Stanford on uh, designing computer systems for, for what uh, uh, we, we've uh, been calling, what others have been calling software 2.0. So, you know, this is a small group here, so if you've got questions, uh, please interrupt in the middle. We can make this as interactive as you'd like. Uh, but otherwise, uh, I'll just uh, drone on. All right, so let's set the stage here, right? So the two big trends in computing are, of course, first of all, the ascendance of machine learning, right? Everybody's talking about machine learning and its capabilities to do tasks that were formerly thought only capable by humans, such as image recognition, language translation, you know, uh, uh, that, that goes on simultaneously, uh, you know, creating knowledge bases from unstructured data uh, and making, uh, you know, scientific discoveries uh, easier, uh, making autonomous driving possible, uh, and, and, and doing uh, all sorts of things that will enable us to, to live longer, right, personalized medicine. So machine learning is applied to any area where, where there's data rich that we can create uh, uh, models on those, uh, based on that data, uh, based on things that we'd like to do, either predictions or, or, or recognitions or things like this. So as you all know, uh, the thing about machine learning is it's very computational intensive, right? Both for training, as you want to train with l more data and, and more complex models, and also for inference, if you want to serve thousands of users uh, uh, for some you know, large web uh, uh, property like uh, Facebook or, or Google, right? At the same time, of course, that machine learning is demanding all this computing power, the underlying uh, substrates that, of course, have powered computing over the last 60 years, uh, you know, CMOS uh, silicon, uh, which, of course, the improvements over time have been, you know, uh, captured by the well-known Moore's Law, is that Moore's law is, is slowing down, right? You know, you can argue about why this is, whether we're re reaching fundamental physical limits or we just can't afford uh, to, to uh, invest $10 billion in, in, in a new uh, process node. Uh, but nonetheless, it's slowing down. And of course, as we all know, Denard scaling, the companion law that talks about what happens to power as we scale, is dead, right? It's been dead for a few generations, which means if we want to increase the number of transistors uh, that we use, uh, then we have to uh, dissipate more power. And we're at the point now where we can put more transistors on a chip than we can really afford to power without kind of burning up the chip. Okay, and so computation is fundamentally limited by power, and this means the good old ways of, of, of using these transistors to build ever more complex CPUs is basically uh, not providing the performance improvements that it has in the past, okay? And so that means that we fundamentally need new approaches to dealing with how we design systems uh, in this brave new world of Moore's Law stagnation and increasing uh, re requirements for computational power. So let's look at machine learning. So this uh, chart kind of shows what's happened over time. And, uh, you know, on the x-axis we've got, you know, data size and, and model complexity. And on the uh, y-axis we have some accuracy on some task, be it, you know, recognizing images or, or doing uh, uh, language translation or, or, or language understanding. 
And so, you know, the whole idea of, of, of machine learning, or, and in particular deep neural networks, has been around for a long time, 50 years or more. And in fact, training these networks using backpropagation, you know, was rediscovered in the 1980s. And so what has made it, uh, uh, you know, so uh, prevalent today, of course, is that the, the uh, data sizes have been getting bigger, and the models uh, used to train uh, the, the, the model complexities have been increasing, and we're at the point where these neural networks are surpassing conventional algorithms and, and reaching human level accuracy on a number of tasks. And of course, this has basically been enabled by you know, computation uh, uh, required to actually uh, compute on all this data. And uh, most of this computation, of course, recently has been provided by GPUs. So this idea of building models based on data as opposed to conventional algorithms that are developed by humans, this is the idea of software 2.0, right? And this term was coined by Andre Kapathy, and when he first you know, came, to, uh, came up with it, I thought, you know, this is a little pretentious, but it, you know, does actually capture, uh, you know, what uh, this new mode of developing software is all about, this idea that you, instead of, you know, decomposing your, your uh, problem into components that you develop algorithms for, uh, instead of doing that, you feed uh, data and features into a training uh, uh, algorithm, uh, and, uh, and you uh, come up with a model, a neural network, uh, that uh, performs the, uh, the, 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 performs the, meets the requirements of your application. So one of the benefits of uh, this approach, or the a couple of fundamental uh, 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 benefits to this software 2.0 approach, one is it's often faster and easier to develop these models than to uh, manually develop algorithms. And uh, the other thing is, is that you know, the run times and the uh, de memory requirements of these algorithms are more predictable uh, than, uh, uh, than conventional algorithms. And a really good example of, of uh, you know, where this is true is in, in Google uh, translation, right? So they, uh, went from 500,000 lines of C code to 500 lines of uh, TensorFlow code uh, for a you know thousand x improvement in productivity. But of course, you know, machine learning has you know become uh, you know most well known for for solving these really high level tasks like image understanding and 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 language uh, translation and autonomous driving and things like that. But you can also apply it to more mundane classical algorithms, uh, classical problems, I should say, such as, you know, data cleaning for uh, you know, feeding data to uh, structured databases, uh, self-driving databases, uh, networking. In fact, any place where, you know, you've got some sort of MP-hard problem and you uh, are solving that problem using heuristics, it's often the case that you can replace those heuristics with a machine-learned model and get both higher accuracy and simpler code. And so what this does then is as more and more of, of the components of your software become things that are models which are learned, it changes fundamentally what software developers do, right? So instead of kind of developing algorithms and, and, and decomposing problems, they are really uh, increasingly they're doing things that have to do about engineering data and figuring out how to uh, manipulate the data such that you can build more accurate models. And one of the tools that's being developed at Stanford to, to help this is a tool called Snorkel, being developed by my colleague Chris Ray and his graduate student Alex Rackner. And so what this does is it takes uh, data and it allows you to manipulate it so that you can build more accurate models. And some of the impl implications of this work are that you know, you think about how this data gets manipulated, uh, then uh, it's possible that uh, the manipulation of the, the data happens in the core of the machine learning training loop, right? And so traditionally think people think of sort of machine learning training as this uh, operation that happens in the, in the uh, 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 linear algebra domain that doesn't really touch you know, data processing, SQL, 
uh, sorts of operations, but uh, in the case of snorkel and some other uh, new ways of doing uh, training, uh, we see uh, the uh, idea of S S SQL queries in the uh, inner, innermost uh, parts of the machine learning loop, right? So what other uh, trends or what other uh, implications of this software 2.0 uh, uh, do we see? Well, one of the th things that we're seeing with the models that get generated are the uh, increasing use of sparsity, right? So what you want to do is have a network that has uh, more layers and has more uh, variables, but you want to reduce, you don't want to do this uh, while blowing up the number of parameters. And so by uh, sp you know, sparsifying your network, you can keep its accuracy uh, while reducing the, the parameters. And so the key thing, of course, is can you train it in a sparse fashion, right? So traditionally people have you know, taken dense networks, trained them to get something that's sparse and focused on, on getting sparsity, but then the notion is what, what about actually training from the beginning uh, in, in a sparse network? That's uh, a, uh, a problem that's not fully solved. So sparsity is kind of uh, fundamental if you want to model the real world, right? So if you want to model people, places, and things and their relationships, uh, then these uh, relationships are fundamentally sparse. And so this idea of graph neural networks is uh, increasingly popular because now you can build uh, more accurate models that, 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 that more faithfully represent the world. So that's another trend that we're, we're seeing. And then, of course, there's a fundamental trend of increasing complexity of the models that are being built and the amount of, tr of computation required to train them, right? So this shows uh, some recent um, networks that are being used for image recognition, voice recognition, and language translation. And as you see, the, the parameter uh, size grows, and so does the uh, amount of computation, uh, which is measured in the exaflops, uh, uh, grows over time. So fundamentally, machine learning training is limited by computation. That's why anybody who says that you know, the growth of machine learning is just about data and model complexity is missing uh, the key element of computation, which of course makes all this possible. And so the question is, you know, if we want to continue to improve the capabilities of machine learning, uh, make it applicable to more problems, make it applicable to, to problems that, that combine multiple mo modalities, then we need more computational capabilities. And as we said, you know, this uh, requirement demand for computation is happening at a time when fundamentally our uh, performance, uh, at least, you know, coming from the uh, from microprocessors is, is starting to uh, plateau, right? So this is a chart that kind of shows the evolution of microprocessor uh, performance and uh, number of transistors over time. And as you see, uh, the, tr the, you know, the golden triangles are, are the, the top represent transistors, and they kind of increase uh, at the uh, rate of Moore's law. And, uh, you know, what we saw is that uh, if you look at uh, you know the power uh, re represented by the red triangles, uh, this kind of uh, hit a wall uh, in the early uh, 2000s, right? And the response, of course, of the microprocessor industry was to go to multi-core. Of course, we did that research in the mid 90s. It didn't take the industry by storm until they ran into the power wall, but you know, we had laid the groundwork. And so uh, fundamentally then, uh, we need to figure out what we're going to do now that kind of multi-core is, 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 is run out of steam too. And so we're in this power constrained environment, right, where uh, power is fixed because we don't want to burn up our chips. And yet we want more performance. So we want more operations per second uh, because we want to provide more capabilities to uh, applications uh, like machine learning. And so fundamentally, this means we need to become more energy efficient, right? So we need to uh, increase uh, the efficiency with which we do the operations. 
And uh, the, uh, typically, the, the way to do that is to add specialization, right? To become more specialized, right? The problem with specialization, as we all know, is that uh, when you specialize, you become less general, less flexible. And so the key uh, challenge, then, is how do you increase flexibility, I'm sorry, how do you increase uh, efficiency while still maintaining flexibility, OK? So key questions, then, for software 2.0 is, you know, how do we provide this 100x improvement in, uh, in, in performance? As I said, it's all about power constrained performance improvements, so it's performance per watt. Uh, we want to do this while maintaining flexibility and programmability. So uh, ideally, we want you know, uh, the nirvana uh, 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 point where we have the efficiency of a, of a fixed function ASIC and the uh, flexibility of a processor. Right? And so how do we get anything close to that? Well, I would. Uh, uh, pretend that you need to do to take to take a full stack approach, integrated uh, integrated full stack approach to the problem that consists of innovations in machine learning algorithms, innovations in languages and compilers that can translate those uh, algorithms into new hardware architectures that can exploit uh, all of the. Uh, um, characteristics of the ML algorithms. Okay, so the rest of my talk then is basically to go over these three key components of the stack and tell you about some of the work that we've done there to, uh, to provide the sort of innovation that's required. So at this point, are there any questions? Yeah. All depends, right? I mean, if, if, if a lot of your time is spent twiddling with heuristics in order to get the performance that you want, uh, the accuracy that you want, you know, you may be able to relegate a lot of that time to the computer optimization algorithm, and you, you, as, you as the user won't have to spend all that much time doing that. Now, on the other hand, of course, you may have to spend a lot of time figuring out what features you need from your data in order to get the accuracy you want, so, yeah. Right. Well, yes, I need great algorithms to help figure out what order the beats should come in and you know, how this works. Because the premise for most of the work is going to be getting pretty dry and very traditional stuff. Is that right? No, no. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of UI sorts of, sorts of issues, but, you know, the core algorithms that, 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 that you know, determine, you know, how you should uh, connect from one of your to your friend community, you know, and and manages manages the social graph. Those are going to be algorithms that lots of people at Facebook spend time on. And you know, Facebook, of course, has a huge uh, machine learning group that that is developing algorithms uh, and use cases for for these sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How do you maintain the modularity of linking your relationship with the language with the lot of one of the things that Very smart compilers. I'll tell you about that. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, I mean, the, it only works if you, if you have that, that, that piece in the middle called the compiler. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. It's all about data flow at the end of the day, right? That's where the challenge is. Well, I mean, the processes are all about both compute and data flow. Yeah. And memory, right? Other questions? 
All right, let's go. I hear some things in the background saying. All right, ML algorithms, right? So the key thing here is uh, the computational model. So software 1.0 computational model is deterministic computations uh, you know, with algorithms, and they are developed by humans. And so you've got to have to, you've got to run your computation uh, in a deterministic and correct way so that, you know, you get the same answer every time and so you can actually debug your program. Uh, software 2.0 model, what you're trying to do is you're, you're trying to take you, these uh, probabilistic uh, models and you train them from data and you're going to typically use stochastic types of algorithms in order to do the training. And so the computation only has to be as accurate enough to meet the statistical requirements of the algorithms that you're trying to run. And so this creates all of the opportunities that you can exploit uh, in the ML space. And so once I saw this, I said, well, this is an architect's dream because there's all sorts of games you can play uh, in architecture and in algorithms uh, and that you know, make uh, the architecture of the implementations easier. So I'll give you an inkling of what you can do. So first of all, let's say a little bit about you know, how one does this optimization uh, problem, right? So almost all of machine learning can be expressed uh, with this little equation up here where we've got some loss function and we're trying to, you know, create a model that, uh, that minimizes this, this uh, loss function over the, the, all the, all the uh, elements of the training set, right? So you might have billions of, uh, of, sample, of uh, uh, samples from the training set. And uh, the idea then is that you are going to uh, come up with this model using a algorithm called stochastic gradient descent. And so stochastic gradient descent, all you do is you go from one model of uh, instance x of k to the next model instance x of k plus one by picking some sample from the data set computing or estimating the gradient and then moving in the opposite direction, right? So very simple. So lots of, the, of these tiny little steps. And so the way that you evaluate stochastic gradient descent is basically by using two kinds of efficiency. The one kind of efficiency we're going to call statistical efficiency, which is the number of iterations it takes you to converge to the accurate model that you want, okay? The other kind of efficiency we're going to call Hardware efficiency, which is the time it takes you to run each one of these iterations. So clearly, the time it takes you to run the whole algorithm is the product of the two efficiencies, right? But then the trade-off that you'd like to make is, you know, can you get a lot of improvement in hardware efficiency for little or no uh, degradation in statistical efficiency, right? And so that is kind of uh, some of the work that we've done uh, does that. So let me give you one example, or one example that hardware designers uh, would uh, appreciate. Yes? One question about the statistically correct part. Yeah. Set the seed for all the random number generators that you use in the algorithm, then it becomes deterministic correct. Even random algorithm. Uh, depends how you, yeah? Yeah. yeah well, it doesn't always, right? And it certainly doesn't because, as I'll say, when you do things in parallel, you have races. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and, uh, and that, yeah. So, but, but I, I, you know, and that, that's, a, that's a, one of the key ideas here is that you can tolerate races, right? So you can update this model in an asynchronous manner without using locks. And you can prove that things still work, right? And so it's not deterministic at all there, right? But, yes, but what are locks to overhead, right? So why lock if you don't need it, right? All right, so low precision. Lots of benefits to low precision, right? Your computation is going to use less energy. Uh, you're gonna, your, your data is going to use less uh, uh, memory capacity. 
Uh, your throughput's going to improve because maybe you can fit more of your data elements into a single SIMD instruction. And so this is something that has been used uh, for uh, inference a lot, right? So Google uses it, uses it in the TPU. Intel supports 8-bit uh, support in their SIMD instructions. Of course, you could uh, use low precision in an FPGA. So what's the downside? Well, the downside is, of course, you are going to reduce your accuracy, right? And this accuracy reduction shows up as noise in the algorithm. Well, the thing about stochastic gradient de descent is it's a fundamentally noisy algorithm. So it has some noise flaw. So what happens is you can add noise to your computation. And if you don't affect that noise flaw, then you're not going to affect the way that stochastic gradient descent works. So that's the key. And so it turns out that people think that you need 16-bit floating point to do training. That's the conventional wisdom. But recently, we've come up with an algorithm called high accuracy, low precision. And the key thing that it does is it moves around the bits that are used to do the training so that it, they get used to the greatest effect. And the way that you do this is by bounding the solution and then scaling, uh, you, then recentering your bits uh, so that you, you use um, the bits uh, in the right uh, place. And we've shown that you can kind of use uh, you know, uh, this, this algorithm with, you know, less than, than you know, with 10 bits and get higher accuracy than, than, uh, uh, than stochastic gradient descent that uses 64 bits, right? And not only does it work in terms of, uh, 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 you know, something that, that's um, logistic regression, which is convex, it also, we can also do it with, uh, uh, deep neural networks, which are non-convex. You can prove things about convex functions. You can't prove things about non-convex problem. problem. About 10 bit fixed point. Yes, I'm talking about 10-bit fixed point. <laughs> okay, so high accuracy, low precision. Uh, so the point here is that you can relax precision and still maintain accuracy. And in general, what I tell architects about machine learning is relax. It's only machine learning, and you can play all sorts of games. You can relax precision and use small integers, and things still work. You can relax synchronization and let data races happen, and things still work. You can turn off your cache coherence. How many people here have worked on cache coherence? Got to be some people, right? It's really complex. It's really hard. It's really difficult. You get it wrong a lot of the time. Some of the time, you get it wrong. Okay, well, it turns out that if you're running machine learning algorithms, it doesn't matter that it's wrong. You can turn off 90% of your invalidates, and you still get the right answer, right? So that was a paper we wrote about the, something we called the obstinate cache, which just ignored invalidate, invalidations. Uh, you can reduce communication. You don't have to communicate the gradients all the time. You can batch them together. You can compensate for the fact that you are sending fewer gradients. So sparse communication is better. And uh, so the whole idea is you know, much better hardware efficiency for almost no degradation in statistical efficiency. And here are a bunch of uh, recent uh, PhD graduates that have kind of uh, done some of this work. All right. So now we've got algorithms that are exploiting the statistical nature of the computation. How do we encode these algorithms? We're going to use domain-specific languages that represent these algorithms uh, as productively as possible from the point of view of the application developer. So let me just say a few words about domain-specific languages. So domain-specific languages are languages that have both operators and data types that match the problem at hand, right? So they're restricted. They don't do everything. They're focused on a particular domain. They're usually high level, and usually they're declarative. You say what you want as opposed to how to do it. And, uh, you know, really good examples of this are SQL in the uh, world of re relational algebra, relational um, uh, data processing, uh, MATLAB for linear algebra. Uh, the innovation that we uh, came up with a few years ago was this idea of a high-performance domain-specific language. The idea that not only could you use domain-specific languages to improve programmer productivity, but you could also use these high-level abstraction constructs to actually 
get much higher computation, especially if you, what you're trying to do was target a variety of different architectures, right? So you wanted to take one high-level domain-specific uh, language representation and map it efficiently onto a multi-core CPU. Take that same representation and map it efficiently onto a GPU. Take that same representation and map it efficiently onto a large cluster, and the high-level program didn't change, right? As we all know, if you actually want to do this uh, with the low-level programming models, then, of course, you know, it'd be, be a complete rewrite. Just to give you a flavor of uh, this, uh, this is uh, k-means clustering in a language we call optimal, which is embedded in a programming language called Scala. I won't you know, bore you with the details of the way, different ways of implementing uh, domain-specific languages, but this is an example of an embedded domain-specific language because it's, it's embedded in a general-purpose programming language. Uh, uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch are, are you know, it's similar. So this uh, is doing uh, k-means clustering where you want to take a bunch of samples and cluster them around some means. So in this case, we've got some green uh, samples and we've got two means, the, the red X and the blue X. We first, you know, group the uh, samples by their distance to the means, and that first couple of lines does that. And then we find the centroids of the new clusters, and those are our new means, and we keep iterating until the means stop moving. Okay, that's k-means clustering. Few lines described in this high-level domain-specific language, and we can, as I said, map it to a variety of different architectures. So that was the point, right? Is sort of, you know, high-level representation, and then mapping to a lot of low-level uh, representations, but efficiently, right? So you want to get the same efficiency, ideally, that you would have gotten had you coded directly to those low-level programming models uh, that were designed for the particular architectures. How do we do it? Well, the key idea is to use this uh, uh, notion of parallel patterns, right? So parallel patterns, are, you can think of them as data parallel operations on collections, where your collections could be sets, they could be arrays, they could be tables, they could be tensors, uh, but you can't get parallelism unless you've got a collection of things, fundamentally, right? Uh, so you, you know, ones that you recognize like map and reduce, uh, zip, which is kind of a multi-collection uh, map, flat map, group by, these are all components of parallel patterns, and the nice thing about parallel patterns is they think of them as a high-level parallel programming instruction set, right? That can encode any of these data processing uh, domain-specific languages. So you can encode SQL. You can encode something like uh, uh, MATLAB. You can encode a graph uh, DSL. And so this is an example of um, uh, the, the uh, k-means clustering that I just showed you in the optimal DSL expressed as a uh, set of, of parallel patterns. And the key thing to note here is that these parallel patterns are nested. So flat map reduce doesn't do it. It's not expressive enough. You need nesting, right? So you need to be able to, to, to nest things. And so if you look carefully, you can see the color coding there at the top the braces shows the, the nesting. So in this particular example, three levels of nested parallel patterns. Okay, so we have a representation that crosses the boundaries of our domain-specific languages so that now you can take uh, a domain uh, a problem that is composed of multiple domain-specific languages is and map them into the single representation and then optimize globally across the boundaries, right? This has a lot of benefits in terms of minimizing data movement and optimizing the parallelism. And that's basically what you want to do in a high-level compiler, right? So you want to take your domain-specific language. In this example, you know, I've showed you a few, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Spark, uh, what have you, map them into this uh, set of parallel patterns, and then do optimization, right? So you op want to optimize the memory performance by optimizing locality. You want to optimize the, the parallelism uh, and, and find as much parallelism and, and match it to the particular way that you're going to execute that parallelism, be it multi-core. If it's a cluster, figure out how to break up the data so that you can 
uh, put the data on the different nodes of the cluster. Okay, so high-level compilation, a key component of this whole process. Uh, and now the question is, okay, so what should the hardware look like that is going to run this computation? Okay, so uh, let's talk about hardware. All right, so what do we got today in the accelerator space for ML? Well, we've got, hey, still a lot of ML training, ML inference gets done on CPUs, and CPUs have lots of threads, lots of cores, right? Because, uh, you know, way back when we said it was a good idea, right? <laughs> and so now they've got lots of threads, and they've got SIMD uh, capability. And now GPU, of course, of course, have taken the idea of, of threads to the extreme, uh, SIMD and also low latency uh, memory close uh, to the, to the uh, uh, GPU chip in the form of HPM. And then TPU, you know, TPU said, okay, uh, matrix multiply is really important, so I'm going to make uh, a big uh, matrix multiply unit, and everything is going to be uh, something that uh, is going to be hit with my matrix multiply hammer, right? Now, of course, that doesn't always work, uh, and so this has some limitations. So the question is, what's next, right? So what should we do next? So one approach would be say, okay, ML algorithm designer, You've got a good algorithm here. Uh, I'm going to take your algorithm and cast it directly into silicon and get you the highest efficiency that you can imagine. So what would be the problem with doing this? Well, there are a lot of ideas in the ML space, right? So this is a, a chart adapted from Jeff Dean, which shows the number of you know, papers uh, being presented uh, in archive, which is, uh, you know, basically where the machine learning community puts their new ideas, is growing faster than Moore's law. So, you know, somewhere in there, there's a good idea. There's probably several good ideas, but as we know, software development timescales and hardware development timescales are completely at odds with each other, right? So any new idea I came up with would take a couple of years to realize, and by that time, there'd be another 10,000 new ideas. And I probably, the idea that I tried to cast in silicon would be, you know, out of fashion by that time. So what we need is some way of, of kind of predicting the future of, uh, of ML algorithms, you look into your crystal ball, and, uh, and what do you see? Well, I think uh, you, you see a number of things, right? Uh, this idea of hierarchical uh, parallel patent data flow really seems to be fundamental, right? We've seen it across the set of data uh, processing algorithms that we've looked at, and so it becomes a very natural ML model. Uh, the idea of being able to support multiple precisions, in fact, even dynamically, we've seen is important for algorithms like HALP. Sparsity is becoming a more important component for things like graph neural networks. And this idea of data processing, SQL uh, in the inner loop of, of ML training, uh, the, being able to do that uh, efficiently is, is going to be important. So fundamentally then, uh, you know, supporting these kinds of capabilities will give you something that, uh, that future-proofs uh, the architecture. And so then the question is sort of, you know, what, how exactly are you going to organize the architecture? And, 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 and traditionally, people have used instructions, explicit instructions, as, as the way that they provide uh, the interface to the hardware, right? So, you know, if you take a computer architecture course from anywhere in, in, the, in, the, in the country, in the world, right, people will talk about the ISA as this interface between software and hardware. And it's a really important abstraction, and clearly it's carried us a long way. But it does have its limitations, right? It's a fixed set of operations, right, which kind of defines things. Uh, it's typically pretty low level, and, you, and, it's, and it's inefficient, right? Because you've got to crack these instructions, decode them, and figure out how to, how to execute them in, in parallel. So traditional uh, acceleration devices, right, use either x86 or ARM, general purpose ISA, or, or maybe GPUs uh, use uh, PTX if, if you're NVIDIA. And the question is, you know, how can we make a better interface to hardware? And so I would contend that something that captures this notion of hierarchical parallel patterns 
is, is, a, is a much better interface to the hardware, right? And so this naturally, uh, you know, leads to something that looks like hierarchical coarse grain data flow, right? So we start with our, our hierarchical parallel patterns. What we get as an intermediate representation uh, that we can express the computation to the hardware is something that looks like hierarchical coarse grain data flow. And then we'll say more about what the hardware should look like uh, given that. But let me say a few words about uh, hierarchical coarse grain data flow and how one might uh, describe that, right? So we want some sort of intermediate representation for this hierarchical coarse grain data flow. Uh, and uh, here we want constructs to express our parallel patterns as hardware structures, right? And as we all know, the, the most efficient way of executing things in hardware is with some, some sort of pipeline, right? So we want some sort of pipeline. Uh, so, and uh, we want to have an explicit memory hierarchy because that's also uh, something that you need for efficiency. Uh, we want hierarchical control and we want a way of parameterizing our representation so that we can match it to different uh, sizes of uh, hardware and, and different uh, types of compute. Okay, so this representation we call spatial, and we've written a number of papers on it. Let me give you an example of what spatial looks like. So suppose you wanted to do a dot product. Everybody knows that the dot product is the core of machine learning, right? You know, that's all, all we do all day long is dot products. So here's the dot product represented in parallel patterns. So it's uh, you zip two vectors together. A zip, remember, is a multi-input map and then you reduce, right? Okay, very simple. Uh, and if you would kind of express it in hardware, right, you'd, you'd have two vectors A and B in, in, uh, in memory, and then you uh, do uh, a reduction, uh, but you do a two-level reduction because you wanna, you wanna actually tile the computation, right? So one of the things that, that a high-level compiler should do for you is translate the computation from unlimited memory in DRAM to limited memory in SRAM, called tiling, right? And so here's a very simple way of tiling the computation of uh, dot product, right? So first of all, you define the two vectors in, in DRAM, the output register, uh, uh, and then you d define two tiles, A and B, a tile for A and a tile for B, and an accumulator. And you do this load of a piece of the A vector into tile A, piece of the t uh, B vector into tile B, a reduction that does the uh, dot product within the tile, and then the outer reduction that does a dot product, uh, does the summation across the tiles. And that's it, okay? So you've got your tile dot product. Uh, it generates hardware that looks something like this, right? So you've got your two tiles, uh, your uh, uh, pieces of, of, of uh, the, uh, the the tile, and, and then uh, the uh, the dot product reduction, right? And so you've got a, bu a bunch of parameters that that need to be optimized, such as the tile size, how much banking you have in the memory how much pipelining you do in the outer loop, we call meta-pipelining, how much pipelining you do in the inner loop, just pipelining, how much parallelism you exploit uh, in the different components. And so the special compiler is very efficient at looking over the whole space, does the design space exploration and comes up with some point that is, uh, is correct and, 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 and optimized for, for your hardware, okay? So spatial captures this, right? So now, so now we've, got, we've gone from parallel pattern IR to hierarchy of data flow graph, hierarchical data flow graph of tile pipelines with an explicit memory hierarchy. That's spatial, okay? So we're coming down in our level of abstraction. Now we get to hardware, because what should the hardware look like? Well, the hardware should match fundamentally our programming model, right? So we should define hardware that's very good at ex executing these parallel patterns. And so we've come up with 
uh, a reconfigurable data flow architecture we call plasticine, which matches this hierarchical data flow uh, that uh, is, is, um, uh, exists in our applications, right? And so it's composed of a number of, of components, and I'm going to explain them to you in just a moment. Uh, we have uh, we haven't taped this chip out, but we have uh, written all of the Verilog for it and uh, evaluated it fairly extensively uh, and compared it to an FPJ of the same technology, and we see dramatic improvements in performance and, of course, program programmability. But in thinking about how to design this accelerator, uh, what we wanted to do is to kind of look at these hierarchical uh, data flow graphs. And, and figure out what kinds of characteristics they had, right? So clearly, SIMD and pipeline parallelism were, were key components. And it was nested. I talk, talked about nested parallelism being a key element of these graphs. The ability to feed the data to the computation efficiently, which means, of course, we've got to exploit locality. And locality is, uh, is present in the spatial representation because it's explicit, right? We've explicitly said what data is in SRAM, what data is in, 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 uh, in DRAM. And so we want to have those kinds of uh, uh, constructs in our accelerator. And uh, in spatial, we have the ability both to do sparse accesses and dense accesses. And so we want to support that sort of thing. Question? The previous slide? Yeah. Yeah. What? Did you? I know you have to. No, no, no. We we implemented uh, the uh, uh, applications directly on Stratix Five. It wasn't a, It was not an overlay architecture. So you understand the notion of an overlay architecture. So there's two. You know, you take some some RTL, and you map it directly to the FPJ. That's the Stratix Five implementation. Okay, and then you take the application, you map it to plasticine. That's the plasticine implementation. Was it, did the plasticine run on? No, 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 no. Twenty-eight nanometer. I'll, I'll come to the evaluation. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll we'll get to that. I'm I'm just giving you the highlights here. Yeah. All right. So. And then, you know, data flow that's both scalar and vector. So let's look at the different components of plasticine. And by the way, plasticine is a children's modeling clay, for those of you who don't know. And uh, someone told me, so why didn't you just call it Play-Doh? And I said, well, first of all, I was born in England, so I didn't play with Play-Doh. I played with plasticine. The other thing is that plasticine is, is actually an oil-based uh, you know, playing uh, modeling clay. So it never hardens. Those of you who know about Play-Doh is it hardens, right? And that's key, because we always want our substrate to be flexible. <laughs> OK, so uh, PCU is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the patent compute unit, and it supports nested parallelism. It's a bunch of uh, pipeline SIMD functional units. Uh, that, so you get parallelism within the SIMD unit, and then, of course, you get parallelism from pipelining, and then you can kind of string these things together uh, to create another level of parallelism. So hierarchical parallelism is, is key. Uh, the uh, patent memory unit, then, is, of course, is to supply data efficiently to the PCUs, and uh, to do that by providing locality and... Uh, and different data access patterns. And so we've got the ability to configure the PMU to support different banking and buffering capabilities. And so you have uh, banking uh, for kind of SIMD uh, execution and, and, then, and then for, uh, so you, you have uh, banking for pipelining, I should say, and then uh, uh, Buffering, so buffering for pipelining and banking for parallelism. And so you've got the ability to do on-chip address generation uh, for uh, generating 
uh, addresses to the array banks, which provide different uh, address interleaving capabilities and address partitioning capabilities. The interconnect is actually uh, three different elements. You have got vector interconnect, uh, scalar interconnect, and control interconnect. They follow the same uh, control, roughly, uh, network control. And then address generators to su uh, support both dense and sparse requests, and then a coalescing unit to uh, provide the interface to the DRAM and to provide support for scatter gather uh, that uh, is, is present in, sp in spatial. Okay, so coming down our compiler stack then, we go from the spatial compiler, we're gonna generate some plasticine IR which maps uh, to plasticine. And so the key things that we do in the plasticine compiler is we go from a virtual space of PCUs and MCUs to physical uh, set of, of PCUs and MCUs, which is uh, uh, PCUs and, and PMUs, I should say, uh, which, uh, which match the particular requirements of the, the hardware that we are mapping to, and we come up with a configuration. So as an example, here's a mapping of uh, dot product to plasticine, right? So the load elements get, go, get uh, mapped to the address generation units, the tiles uh, get mapped to the PMUs, uh, the uh, compute gets mapped to the uh, PCUs, and of course the interconnect is the thing that connects the pieces together, okay? So uh, the implementation that we uh, worked out had, had 64 PCUs and 64 PMUs, uh, 16 megabytes of on-chip memory, was in 28 nanometers and ran at one gigahertz and consumed 49 watts. Most of the uh, area was taken up by the PCU and the PMUs, and then most of the PCU, of course, was the functional units, and most of the PMUs was the memory. We compared it to an FPGA of roughly the same technology, 28 nanometer technology. Uh, we implemented plasticine using the chisel uh, register transfer level uh, design language, which was uh, developed at Berkeley. What we see is we, we look across a full range of applications, not just machine learning applications, but we wanted this to be a general purpose accelerator. And so we go everywhere from uh, memory bound applications such as TPCH and uh, Black Shoals to algorithms that uh, are, have a lot of sparse uh, main memory access and here, you know, so in the case of the uh, algorithms that have uh, our bandwidth, memory bandwidth bound, you know, the performance improvements we get are small and they are relative to the extra bandwidth uh, capabilities that uh, plasticine has over the FPGA. I'll take that question back there first. Uh, so we didn't uh, compare to to the to the uh, to the TPU, but there's no reason that it would would be that far off from it because we we are. If you look at the computation that gets done, it's, it's executed in a systolic fashion across the chip in a similar way that the uh, the TPU works. Yeah, you had a the y-axis is is, uh, is 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 basically. Uh, Ratios, right? So, so what we're looking pla so the the uh, it, the y axis so so the, the one is the FPGA, and we're looking at both performance and performance per watt. So sorry for not stating that. Your question, yeah. Yeah. Well, the levels of compilation will get to the optimal, but there's lots of optimization you can do in 
mapping any particular TensorFlow graph, right? The sort of how you decide to, how much parallelism you decide to exploit in the different operators, you know, whether you do uh, data parallelism or whether you do, uh, you know, parallelism across the, the, uh, the graph, uh, that you can decide uh, what to do there, and then the particular implementation of the operators, right? Yeah, you've got to do that. There's lots of optimization you've got to do. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, you don't have to read. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With a simulator. With a simulator. Pardon? Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's cycle level simulation. It's RTL level simulation on both sides. Yeah. Yeah, well, dynamics prism support here. It's in the, in the, in the, it would be in the PCU. We didn't have it at this, when we did this evaluation. This is, this is from 2017. So that was before we, did, before we knew how to do help. So there's some, you know, I'm, I'm showing you hardware that, you know, came out of the research before we did the, the help work. Yes. Right. So maybe in the CNN, you see a level of professional, or what is the Well, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is, uh, we'll get to it, but, but uh, what you want is much higher flexibility, much more efficient use of the, you know, you are getting performance per watt improvements, right? Uh, so remember, the, 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 the contention always was that FPGAs were m even more efficient than FPGAs in terms of performance per watt, right? So, sorry, well, the FPGAs were more efficient than GPUs compared, you know, right? So the question is, uh, could you get a lot better without designing an ASIC, right? This is not a fixed function device, after all. This is a flexible device. Yeah. Uh, I'm missing the question. Um, yeah, 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 yes, yeah, right, right. First you configure, then you execute, yeah. And the question is how quickly you can reconfigure, yeah. So it's not an ASIC. <laughs> I mean, it's an ASIC in the sense that it implements the plasticine architecture, but it's not fixed function. It's more like a coarse grain reconfigurable architecture, yes. All right, so uh, when we do things in sparse, uh, we get the factor 10 because we've got much more efficient ways of, of doing sparse data accesses. And then when you get to compute heavy workloads like uh, GEMS and CNNs, you get the uh, almost 100x improvement. So this is some data uh, on some recent uh, uh, comparisons that we've done to to the V100 and to Brainwave, which is uh, Microsoft's implementation of uh, FPGAs using uh, 14 nanometer uh, technology and, and V100 is using 12 nanometer technology. And what this is showing, and this is for, for language models, LSTMs and GRUs, and what this is showing is, is the mismatch between the primitives that are supplied by uh, the libraries, in, the ca in this case, QDNN and uh, the uh, QDNN, QDN, QDNN is, is, is providing you matrix multiply, and the brainwave is, is uh, providing uh, matrix vector 
uh, kinds of computation. And it turns out by having these generalized patterns, you can do a much better fit to the computation, uh, and you can do a fusion of a lots of different operators in the graph. And ultimately, what, mean, what that means is you get much better utilization of the flops or, or, or that you have, right? So uh, what we're seeing with plasticine uh, in a much uh, older technology is, is better performance uh, than you get um, uh, with, uh, uh, with some of these other architectures.